So let's open it up. Firstly, thank you so much, Chorus and Liz and Ryan. Fantastic presentation. So it really gives us such a wonderful overview of citizen science. Um, anyone want to kick off the, the questions? Just hit the put up your hand and we'll go through. Astrid, you're free. Thanks. Thanks a lot for these uh, very inspiring talks. Really, I very much appreciate what you told us uh, today. Um, but as much as I like the idea that citizen science projects might change the minds uh, of people to a more ecologically grounded worldview, uh, as a scientist, we still have to look that we get data that are useful for us. And I am, as you can maybe see in the back, I'm working on smaller insects than dragonflies. And um, I find it very hard to, um, yeah, to think of what citizen science this can contribute in terms of uh, mayflies, uh, stoneflies, or caddisflies, because they are much uh, smaller, mm -hmm. and they are there is not they are not so well seen uh, as adults. You can only or you will mostly um, collect them as in as, as larvae. Yeah. And this brings me automatically to the question about the quality control. So about quality controlling the data that are um, brought in. Uh, I think for the Odonata map, uh, I have seen there is a status accepted. So I think someone then um, says oh, this species is okay. So my question would be, how is the quality control in, 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 in your um, projects? Um, because I think mostly it would need an expert and how is this expert then paid? It's always a, 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 a matter of um, funds for those experts, I think. And I would also be interested whether you also already use automatic uh, image recognition for um, um, quality controlling the photos that are uploaded. Well, all of it. I'll have a stab at answering, okay. uh, answering that. So the, um, um, the, the um, amazingly, amazingly, there are, um, there are, there's another team of citizen scientists who, um, whose contribution to the project, or one of their contributions to the project, is actually doing the identifications and um, and, and, and amazingly, there are there are people who actually enjoy doing that. And Ryan is one of one of the um, the people. So there's about six or eight um, members of the expert panel for Odonata Map, and um, the system is set up that um, that before an identification is confirmed, two people have to agree on the um, identification. In the in the bird uh, one, bird virtual museum, we just have it set up for one person to, uh, to to do the identification. So you do you have to identify an avocet? You don't need a second person to check up on your identification. So um, um, the, um, the, the 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 quality control from that perspective is, I think, pretty good. And um, so it's identification by um, by experts, um, not identification by democracy. So the the observer puts what he or she thinks is the um, is the is the species, and that helps. Usually helps <laughs> enormously. <laughs> Occasionally with dragonflies, I get it so wrong that I must actually uh, confuse the expert panel, and they were to uh, tell the bloke in charge that he's got it wrong. They do quite happily. And, um, and and they're under no pressure to identify to species. So um, an and, and awful lot of the, um, the drop wings that I submit just get identified to genus. And uh, they can't do the identification to species, they don't do it. So, um, so it's, it's, it's actually quite, quite, a, um, quite a tight and a robust system. Um, the bloke who does the uh, the butterflies is amazing because he has a, um, a mental picture of the map of the distribution of 800 species of butterflies in his head. And if a, 
And if a record is out of range, he actually spots it. And I just think that's an incredible talent. So he, he, he reports this, their range extensions very quickly. And, um, and so, so there's a, a really, really amazing team of people who actually do the identifications. And amazingly, they, they do it as, um, as, as part of their citizen scientist um, hobby. Okay, so um, means... so we are we are very keen to um, to tie up with um, the the there's a, a Dutch Belgian project called observations.org and they do um, um, image recognition mm -hmm. um, and, and and we're um, we, we, we're talking very seriously with them about uh, uh, col collaboration and that's one of the things that we would love to collaborate on is is, is, is getting you know, getting the the IDs done by automatically where possible, that could help. But um, so that means it's basically also here mainly voluntary work, which is fine as long as you have experts uh, uh, in this uh, on this level. Um, and the other question is, do you did you try any other group living in fresh waters uh, that is not fish and not amphibians and not odonata? Um, no, no, we haven't. So, um, so I, I, th I think there are, there are limitations to what is citizen scienceable, and I think um, I think uh, I, I think there are lots of things which are um, which would be extremely difficult to get large volumes of data mm. from. But uh, but there are there are always people who uh, who do you just take on these these challenges and. Uh, and, and gosh, we've been amazed at, um, at the response, say, to uh, for some of the projects that Lens people will go to. Uh, I think, Ryan, you've got ideas on, uh, on, on projects for some of these more difficult species, or groups of species. Yes, I've, I've had a few ideas, but um, the, the big problem comes down to identifiability of mm. the, the taxa. Dragonflies, for example, is relatively a simple group to because there's there's a lot of resources out there on identification. South Africa has around 164 species in total, so so it's not an overwhelming number. And the adult form of almost all of them are pretty easy to identify if you know what you're looking for and you've learned, you know, the steps and and so uh, similar to, to birds in in many ways. Whereas as I can obviously tell with um, mayflies, other things like dung beetles, it, it gets a lot more tricky where there's, there's really a limited amount of people who know what to look for. And, and, and just by the, the very nature of those creatures, they are harder to identify. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not maybe suitable for every kind of taxon, but um, the, the obvious um, and distinctive and colorful groups, I think, um, these projects, I think, can work very well. <laughs> yes, one of the one of the other things that is absolutely essential for running one of these projects is actually is to have a, um, a, f a fairly well established um, taxonomy, mm. and, uh, and 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 a taxon that's got a lot of species which are just just can't be identified. So uh, so so we have a um, a, a, a lacewing map project, and. Um, um, the, the identifications are all done by uh, Mervyn Mansell, who spent his life uh, working with, with um, damsel uh, um, lacewings. And the rate at which lacewing map is uh, collecting data far exceeds what the, um, the um, museum people were doing at the height of museum collection. And, um, and the lacewings, I think, are, are, are tolerably well known. But every now and again, Mervyn says, this, this is a species which must be new to science. So uh, that's, that's quite, quite fun, quite fascinating. And quite difficult, I think, as, uh, as well, challenging. And I think many other groups will be, uh, will be like that too. So you have to choose your, your, your group that you're going to uh, focus on, I think, or whatever you're going to focus on. You have to choose it quite carefully that you can know what you you can look at, looking at it and that you can identify it um, you know, from, from, from a photo, mm -hmm. from a virtual museum perspective. But from, from, from your experience, 
uh, this boils down to uh, mayflies, stoneflies, dragonflies are just not suitable for citizen science projects. Ryan, you'd have to answer well, that. Can I leap in here at this stage? Yep. So, yeah. so with, with, I mean, as said, I'm not sure, I'm sure you're aware of like the citizen science mini SAS, you know, where it's yeah. with, for aquatic invertebrates, you know, we have to have it at a much coarser level in terms of taxonomy. So it's order. So you could say, you could teach a citizen scientist how to identify a stonefly versus a mayfly versus a dragonfly. But yeah, I mean, certainly in South Africa, we haven't got to the point where we can do it at, at any greater resolution. Yeah, but this, that doesn't help biodiversity research. I mean, if we uh, just know the order. But if we have them at order already, then maybe we uh, can attract the interest for to go a little bit deeper. And then mm -hmm. taxonomy needs to be clarified for larvae. And this is, um, I think, uh, a huge problem with our groups. Mm. Yeah, for the for the moths, um, which is which is a um, group that that's, the taxonomy is very unsettled. The um, if the um, if the IDs are just done to um, to, to family, then um, um, then the, the ultimately family specialists can actually go through those uh, those those records so it's quite easy just to pick out some family of moths and actually go through them again and um, and, and do the identifications then as far as uh, as far as possible so it's, it's, it needn't be just a, a one pass system you could actually do it as a as a two-phase thing so you get all the moths of one family you know sorted out and then those can go to the um, to the family specialist. So there are strategies like that, which we um, which we can use. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, any other questions? If not, I would have another one for the Odonator map or uh, for the Dragonfly Atlas. Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, Les, uh, no, uh, Ryan, you showed the, the maps um, where you said they were generated from the Odonator map, so the, the maps in the atlas. Uh, and I was wondering, are they generated on the fly or do it, does it need any update uh, process between Odonator map and the atlas maps? Yeah, I well, think it's... Of course, Les, to argue <laughs> he makes the maps. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. so... so um, so, so my background is actually um, statistics rather than biodiversity. I, I'm a, I'm a total, uh, total fraud um, in the, uh, that I, my PhD is, is abstract um, multivariate analysis, no biological input as well. So all I know about biology is what my um, colleagues and my students have, have taught me over the years. So, um, um, the um, so so Ryan was making maps from the virtual museum, and those maps were being made on the fly, and uh, and 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 the, and, the, and the data being sent to a pretty remote spot in the in the Karoo, and uh, and then coming back to us on the, on the Zoom. So it was actually amazing how fast the uh, the, the maps are made on the. Um, um, virtual museum website uh, extracting the data from the database. So if you, you upload a, um, a, a record and it gets identified, then it's immediately it becomes part of the uh, virtual museum maps. And then it becomes automatically part of the Atlas maps. No, no. So so then it becomes part of the um, of, of the, the database, and you can produce um, maps of it. But the um, but the, the those. Um, Maps which we call in the the imputed maps, those those would have to be made at um, at at, um, at at intervals and, and re-uploaded. So I'm making those maps in um, in Genstat at the moment, and um, and Genstat is, is not very good at producing maps. So the maps consist of little circles, which is really mm. you know they're, they're diagrams rather than uh, rather than maps. So the next phase will actually 
the next generation of maps will, um, will include um, a process that actually produces uh, proper, proper grid maps. And we've done that and we proved it. And as soon as we get to the middle of the year, so we have the, the middle of the winter, we'll do a download, we upload the maps. But the maps don't change very much from, mm. uh, from iteration to, uh, to iteration. And those maps are, com are, are produced by a um, interpolation pro process. So there's two ways of basically doing maps. Is you can either do um, um, a niche modeling type approach, which is what things like uh, Max Ent do, or you can uh, use um, the um, an interpolation uh, approach. So it, it just um, it just does its best to uh, to fill in the um, in the gaps in distribution. And if the data is fairly complete, then um, then the um, the, the imputing, the interpolation process is, um, is, is, is pretty good. So the, the, that process uses the information on, um, on places where lots of data has been collected and the species is absent, and it actually uses that information, whereas the max n type approaches just use the presence data mm. where the mm. uh, species has, uh, has occurred. So um, that's actually, it's my ambition to um, to actually merge the, uh, the the two methods and use the, the imputing approach as a kind of a, a prior distribution for going into something like Maxent, and then it comes out with a posterior distribution which is adjusted for the uh, the, the, the environmental variables. Okay, thanks for clarification. All right, thanks, Jim. I see your hand is raised, Jeremy. Want to go ahead? Yeah, hi Les, and yeah, thanks everyone for all three for really, really interesting talks. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even go and make a cup of tea once. Really, really, <laughs> really cool. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a couple of questions. I think um, the first one is, I mean, so you, I know that you and your team have been involved in citizen science since before it became citizen science, which is probably quite a long time ago. And um, obviously the, the, plat the, the platform that's widely used at the moment is iNaturalist. So my question is how much overlap is there between the, what the two platforms do and how do you uh, manage that? And how do the two platforms uh, interoperate? I think I think the answer to that is is is, um, is at the moment there's um, there's there's no um, interoperability. I think those are, are political questions rather than practical questions. And I would dearly love to see um, you know sort of some uh, overlap. And I know Ryan would like that as well because there are um, very valuable distribution records in our naturalist which are. Are, are not getting into the imputed, imputing process for the for the maps, so that's something I'd I'd like to uh, I'd like to to solve. But it's just at the moment it, it doesn't seem to be a an, an easy an easy uh, political hurdle to get over. Okay, and then thanks, Les. And then my next question is: um, I was actually chatting to a colleague about this yesterday, and this challenge of connecting citizen science data sets to decision making. Um, Helen mentioned earlier about our freshwater citizen science tool, the mini SAS tool, which is, which is really great at estimating the quality of water in a river. But, um, you know, a lot of these assessments have been done, but how many of them have actually filtered their way up to the decision making level? I'm really not sure. I think um, but, but, but I know that, you know, the kinds of data sets that some citizen science uh, efforts are, are providing are, are highly valuable for decision making. How have, um, how have you guys fed your citizen science data into decision making and have you been able to sort of track the impact that the data sets have had at that sort of level or, yeah, if you could speak to that a bit, I'd be quite interested. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think um, that, that rolling the data up the hill to, um, 
to policy to actually decision making is an incredibly difficult uh, process and um, and, I, and I, I think before our um, JRS project was was transferred from UCT to Freshwater Research Centre, I don't think we were making any real headway there. So I, th I think I think you guys have got the uh, got the best solution that we've come up with, and that's the um, the FP, FBIS, um this project and. Uh, and I think you've just done amazingly well with that in terms of actually you know, getting the data into the uh, into the decision system. So, um, so um, uh, that was one thing I was hoping Ryan would also say is that one of the places where you actually get access to the um, to the to the Dragonfly Atlas is actually through um, FBIS. And uh, so, so when you when you choose and uh, no, choose a dragonfly. One of the options that you have is actually is to link to the uh, to the atlas, and I think that's um, that's going to I think help enormously is actually to get the the information at least into the eyes of the <laughs> decision maker. I'm talking about eyes too much this morning. I don't know whether I I, I I don't know whether you were setting me up for that question, Jeremy, or whether. <laughs> But I, 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 I think what you guys are doing with FBIS is simply amazing. And I really wish you all the success with like, actually yeah. taking it Thank, further. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, I know I wasn't setting, setting you up, but uh, I can see how it looks like that way. <laughs> but thanks for the, for, for, the, for the supportive words. And yeah, that is the focus of, uh, of the, of the follow-on project is to try and yeah. take mm -hmm. these kinds of data sets closer to the top of it, that hill. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's not going to be a smooth ride, um, but yeah, thanks so much. That that answers my question. Thank you. Great, thanks. I just wanted to make a comment in relation to that, uh, Les and Ryan. It might be quite a nice option to include a link from the Atlas pages back to FBIS, you know, where you actually have a to the specific yeah. taxon query. So, for example, each of your species, because I think FBIS just provides you yeah. know the, the data over time yeah. and a little bit of extra graphics um but create that synergy between you know going yeah. mm. back from the one to the other just made a note to to mention yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. but i think um, i'm currently going... busy adding links to all pages sorry ryan <laughs> sorry i'm currently busy adding links to all the pages so i will i will add all those on perfect um, no, that'll be yeah. great I think the more that we can create these links and synergies between projects, the you know, it, I mean, you can't create a one-stop shop, but creating links, you allow a person to enter at any point and then yeah. explore a whole lot of interrelated uh, yeah. resources, which I think is extremely valuable. Yeah. But Liz, I mean, you know, the next phase of our FBIS is also going to be mobilizing the frog map data. So just for, you know, everyone, in the room, the next sort of aspect, which will probably kick off in June, um, is to get the, in the same way we've mobilized the Odonata map data is to mobilize the frog map data through the same dashboards, et cetera, that's currently in FBIS. And obviously we'll be chatting to you around that. Um, yeah, so, so, so potentially um, we, we can actually do a, a frog atlas on a very similar basis to what we've done this dragonfly atlas mm. and i think i think ryan knows quite a lot about frogs don't you <laughs> yeah fair, a fair <laughs> amount <laughs> it's one of my interest groups of interest for me so yeah mm. i definitely now, think that we'll ryan be... ryan ryan is is um, is is an excessively modest man he's a is an expert with all sorts of all sorts of uh, things. It's really quite 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 remarkable. <laughs> well, it's glad that you're part of the group. Then it's awesome. <laughs> I think um, what you've done with the atlas, uh, you know, the atlas pages is is fantastic resource. I really do think it is, and and we're feeling very inspired to do it for fish, and you know, even some of the aquatic inverts because. Chatting, I'm involved in a in an invertebrate traits project as well, and we are way behind what you've done in Europe, Astrid. But um, 
you know, we're really at the early stages, but to have a link as at, at a taxon level, you know, where the information exists, like on habitat and, you know, whichever, whatever information is available at a species level would be so useful. Um, and and using, using it as a, as FBIS as a sort of a link point, which is also something we're hopefully striving towards. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question in the chat from Laban. I'm just saying, do you encourage the citizen science to, to catch the animals? I think especially the ones that are not easy to see um, and then they can be preser preserved or processed um, for identification. I don't think the citizen science is really about catching, it's photographing. That's your method of, of visual observation. Visual observation and then photographic record Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, um, you don't need permits to take the photographs, but as soon as you start handling the animals, then you start to need uh, need permits. Exactly. So, uh, so that's that. I think is a is a consideration. Chorus, just also a comment from me. I, I really, really, really enjoyed your presentation, um, and the you know the the framing it in terms of how citizen scientists grow and how it changes their perception in terms of the connection between, you know, with nature and your analogy with, you know, the, the syringe and the pandemic, et cetera, I think is, is very apt in today's, you know, world. And I just, yeah, very, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, uh, keen interest to view all three presentations on, on the channel because there's a lot of um, extremely great visuals and great information that you've shared with us today. Great, thank you, I'm glad.